I'm Mayor David Narkowitz, and thank you for coming to this uh, tour of our new Complete Streets improvements that we've been making on uh, Pleasant Street. We call it Pleasant Futures, was sort of the planning process. Um, I wanted to first uh, introduce all the various city officials that are here. Um, uh, there are some other elected officials here. I know that Ward 4 City Councilor Gina Louise Sierra is here somewhere. There she is. Um, and is here um, and you guys kind of this is where you guys meet sort of where your wards where your wards meet so, uh, so you're right here at the uh, at the border um, and then I'm also joined today by um, our director of planning and sustainability Wayne Fiden um, and our city engineer uh, Dave Valletta um, uh, obviously this is a, a, a joint collaboration between uh, planning and sustainability and, and DPW uh, to make this happen. Um, I also have to acknowledge um, the District 2 Highway um, uh, Director, I want to call him Administrator, but he's Highway Director um, from Massachusetts Department of Transportation or MassDOT, uh, Patrick Paul. Um, these grants that we used to fund this project were both uh, state grants that we applied for uh, through the Mass Department of Transportation. One was the Complete Streets Grant, um, and then the other one is actually a, a larger economic development grant uh, for Pleasant Street that's through a program called the MassWorks Program, which is an infrastructure grant program to promote economic development and housing. Uh, and so. We're sort of using funds from both of those grants to do this project. Um, the backstory, obviously, uh, Pleasant Street um, has been seeing a lot of great new development happening, um, and we have these two amazing uh, affordable uh, and mixed-use redevelopment projects that are happening. You, one of them's right behind us here. Uh, the folks from Pathways, the housing agency formerly known as HAP Inc., uh, uh, pathways. Uh, this is the Live 155 project, and then you can actually see down there the Northampton Lumber Company, uh, former Northampton Lumber Company, which will be the home to the future uh, Valley CDC Lumberyard project. So, when we applied to uh, the uh, Commonwealth of Massachusetts, a big part of our grant for the MassWorks project was we wanted to make infrastructure improvements to help leverage and support these two big projects. We're going to have all this new uh, residential and new commercial and so we wanted to really create amenities to support that and to make this street uh, less of a state highway, no offense to, uh, to our state <laughs> official, um, and more of a city street. Uh, and so uh, Wayne's going to take us on a, uh, a tour of all the amenities we built, but it's really, I think, a, an important example of how you know, the city has a commitment to obviously building complete streets and sustainability and to making sure we provide access for walking and biking and safety. We also have a goal of promoting economic development. Um, and promoting more housing in our downtown because the mark of a really strong downtown is a downtown that people are living in um, to help support the businesses and the restaurants and the markets and all those things. So, um, so we really view this as an important public investment uh, that we can help leverage these two projects and some of the other um, business improvements that you've seen along the corridor and that we hope are going to continue. And it kind of dovetails in with the work that the state recently did in building the new roundabout, which will eventually be turned over to the city to really create a beautiful southern gateway to the city as you approach the city um, and then make your way into what really is an extension of our downtown. So that's what the project's about. Um, and I'm going to turn it over to Wayne Fiden uh, to drill down into the details of, uh, of the project. If you don't mind, could I sure, say something please quickly? Do. I, ju I just want to let everybody know, you know, Mass DOT is a huge proponent of complete streets. Uh, what are complete streets? That's something I think Wayne's going to get into a little deeper with you here, but it's basically applying all types of uh, transportation modes into, into a community, into streets. And when you look around, I think Northampton is a fantastic example of what we're trying to accomplish there. Um, Wayne will get into it a little deeper, but we have all modes of transportation here. We have safe walkways, uh, sidewalks for, for pedestrians, uh, bicycle paths that are safe. Uh, that, that's the type of thing we're trying to do throughout throughout the Commonwealth. And uh, and I think Northampton here is a is a congratulations on this project. It's a it's a great example of uh, what we're trying to do here. In Thank the you. State fund. Thank you. For
And actually, before I turn it over to Wayne, I did. I, I was supposed to mention. And, and to interrupt you one more okay. time. You know, the mayor, the, the mayor arrived by bike here today. That's what I was. So, I mean, that's it. That's, that was my segue. So well, I, I'm sorry. We um, we actually just made an There's announcement. There's any thunder. I'm here to grab it. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> uh, the um, th this is actually a B Wigan uh, uh, bike share bike. We actually just announced yesterday. Uh, Northampton is the lead community in a uh, regional bike share initiative that's being also collaborated on uh, by PVPC is leading it. And um, thank you. And so yesterday we announced that we had selected Bewegan to do to basically be the vendor. Uh, so they will be providing the bicycle and the technology uh, for a, a regional bike share system that'll serve Northampton, Amherst, South Hadley, Holyoke, and Springfield. Um, and this is a actually a power assist bicycle. It looks kind of heavy and clunky, uh, but it's got a really sophisticated uh, electrical system in it that um, it's not an electric bike, it just gives you a little bit of an assist. Um, and so uh, we really think it's going to, to sort of help us achieve the goal, which is to get people who wouldn't normally want to go by bicycle and may say, I, you know, I'm not going to pedal all the way uphill to Florence um, to, to get on a bike and to try it and hopefully uh, become repeat offenders. So, uh, so I just wanted to point that out that I actually rode uh, the bike yes. over here and uh, it's pretty cool. So check that out afterwards as well. So now I'll turn it over uh, to Wayne. So my job is to take you in the weeds and talk about the individual components. But I just want you to remember what you heard from the mayor and, and from Pat, because you always sort of, we always think you need the big vision for where you're going down. So even though it's a bunch of steps, no one thing we're doing would be successful by itself. If you just had a raised intersection and didn't do anything else, then what you get is cars driving through at 50 miles an hour, hitting the raised intersection, and it's not really going to slow things down. So everything out here is thinking about the entire system from start to finish. So the, the roundabout that MassDOT finished last year, I guess technically is finishing this year, is really important because it starts setting the stage, right? That becomes eventually not downtown like Main Street, but a more walkable area, slower speed of traffic. Um, and we don't want someone to be reaching here and hitting pedestrians for the first time. We want them to start slowing down over there. So we're sort of doing this in reverse because we're gonna start here and walk down a bit. But when you get further down, you're gonna see we narrowed the road dramatically. We narrowed it down by 15 feet, I think. Um, so we took out, we put two cycle tracks, basically bike lanes that are separated from the road and a row of parked cars. And there's still two lanes of travel, whereas there used to just be two lanes of travel. And that's important, you know, when we get down there, I talk about it's great to make bicycles happy, and we obviously wanna do that. But even if no bicycles ever uses a cycle track, it's success because we narrowed down the street to in essence 10 and a half feet and that gets people to drive much slower. And so the cycle track and the curb extension you're standing on, all those things are as important as that overall picture that, that we're doing here. Um, and then th the last thing in terms of that big vision is, so we had two state agencies, one who's in the economic development business, and they're really excited because we know that economic development goes up dramatically when people can walk. We have on Main Street, not on Pleasant Street, but on Main Street, I think the highest pedestrian rates on any place west of Route 128. But it drops down dramatically. That's not what we had on Pleasant Street. And so we're trying to figure out, you know, what are the things that we do here that make these things more attractive? Um, so uh, this project, Wayfinders Project, was going to get built anyway, but probably the first floor would have been offices and we want to make it more successful so it might be a restaurant, it might be retail, we, the things that require you know, foot traffic that's here. Um, the other last thing I say about the big picture is this road when we started had about 17,000 cars a day. We don't want to change that. That's the lifeblood for Northampton, that's the lifeblood for the businesses along here, and if we did change it, cars is going to drive through the neighborhoods and that doesn't help anyone. So the goal is to get cars to drive slower but not to divert them somewhere else because we still, again, it, it keeps the city alive. So with that, I'm just going to talk about individual components. I, I only print about 45 and so I ran out, but there's a sheets going around sort of showing what we did. But I'm going to walk you from uh, north to south and we can walk south a little bit. So again, in terms of components, this area is sort of a little plaza. So we have the, there's a bike rack here. We have so far, uh, I think, 13 bike racks we're putting up along the area. Again, an experiment. We used to use the big U's on downtown, which are great, but they take a lot of space. 
real estate's at a premium, so we're switching these bike racks to take up less space, but still support two bikes. Um, this is a new bike repair station. We had one of these in Pulaski Park that's worked well. This is our, it's the fourth one in the city, but the second one the city owns. There's a private one in Florence, there's a state one on, on Damon Road. Um, yeah. And this was thanks to Wayfinders, who's here somewhere. Um, so they help, help support this process along with the grants that we have out here. Across the street, you see a new bike rack. We have a bike that's sort of all been but, but abandoned. So we're still dealing with that. We have one old bike rack we want to replace, but we come out every single day and the bike's still there. So at some point we have to work with the police on what do we do when a bike's been there for six months. But, so we haven't quite solved that. Um, and so again, what you're on is probably the most dramatic change. We've had some curb extensions. Pleasant Street had some curb extensions that were done 35 years ago. That was the first ones we had in the city. <coughs> then we waited 30 years, and then we did some curb extensions on at State Hospital, Village Hill, those curb extensions. Um, and now we're sort of back at doing it. But this is our first raised intersection. And so we had a problem before of bicyclists coming. Bicyclists break the rules just as much as cars. So we had a problem with bicyclists racing down and going to the street and almost getting killed. So we put those granite blocks there that we recycle. This used to be a railroad track, so we recycle that here. That stops the bicyclists from going through. And then we have a raised intersection. You're allowed to cross the intersection at an, at an angle. Cars are hopefully going slow enough that they're going to yield to you. Um, and we're going to start, keep working on getting that message through that pedestrians and bicyclists have the right of way. You're supposed to be walking your bicycle. You don't have the right of way if you're bicycling. Um, so, that, so this big raised intersection here. We also did curb extensions. So again, you have about 10 and a half feet from curb to curb, which is about as narrow as we can get. Um, and we had the granite blocks. Um, again, we experimented. One experiment that didn't work particularly, frankly, is we put a, con a, a granite bollard right here, and that affected service vehicles that had to go into Union Station. So again, we always knew there'd be some things that wouldn't work out. Cambridge was sort of the leader in a lot of these things. When Cambridge began, they said, you got to save about 20% of the budget for taking things out. And you just got to be honest to people so everybody knows that. So you're not surprised. That's, that's what it takes to, to learn. We've a fort learned from Cambridge. So for us, it's close to about 1% of things. But there are going to be some things. Um, and then again, this concrete sidewalks here. There's a lot of stuff you're not going to see. And so, so I'm a planner. So I have these big picture things. And so DPW was great about sort of the detail. So it was DPW would send inspectors out, and they would figure out every single tripping hazard. So the places where we adjusted the granite curbs and adjusted the concrete to meet it and the brick pavers, just because they would notice this quarter inch lip that I wouldn't notice. And, and Felix Harvey from DPW would say, oh, that's a trip hazard. Someone's going to fall over that. And so we'd do something and, and, and solve that problem going through there. Um, the, the other thing that's sort of scattered up here is a lot of street trees. Now, this is a defined right of way. You know, if we were starting life over again and we had a wider right of way, there'd be more trees here. So we don't have nearly as many trees as would be ideal, but you live with what you have. One of our rules for this to make this an affordable project was we didn't buy an extra inch of right of way. So you know, the, the edge of the roadway is exactly what the edge of the roadway was a couple of years ago. Um, but the street trees vary. We have some trees that are just planting the street tree, right, where it was an old tree or a tree had died. There's some places where we sort of redid the whole tree pit and it absorbs water and it's wonderful. And you actually see this less concrete. So we, there's some places where we tried to get to, what did you try to do, eight feet by three feet? Yeah. So there are places where there was this little hole that was two feet by two feet, and you could plant a wonderful tree, it'll look great, and three years later it would die. And so we tried to open those up. So we tried to put the structural soil in, we tried to make them larger, and so you see that in places. It's most dramatic in front of the liquor store, for example, that we just sort of took out whole sections of, of pavement through there. Um, so I'm going to just sort of, from here on, we sort of walk down, and, and you won't be able to see, there's a lot of us, so it's hard to get everyone, so I'm going to walk two blocks. But look, so this is a raised intersection um, with a curb bump out. We're going to go by Short Street and Pleasant Street with a raised crosswalk. So whereas here the entire intersection is raised, there just the crosswalk is raised. It uses DPW's new, relatively new um, the width of the crosswalks, which are wider than they used to be. Um, but it, so it's raised up. The raised up incidentally is important for a few reasons. It's not a speed bump. We get big trucks that move through here, particularly if you ever watch the, um, the car loading vehicles you know, carry new cars, they are really low and you will see some scratching on the raised areas. That's just a reality for doing it because they're so low. And we get emergency vehicles through here. So this isn't like a speed bump you might put in a residential neighborhood. What the hump is doing more about is 
um, slowing down cars a little bit, but even more importantly than that, sending that symbolic message out, the pedestrians count, and raising your height. So I'm six feet, my daughter's five feet, and so cars can see my daughter a lot closer in than they can see me. That six inches that we raised it, or five inches that we raised it, um, really makes a big difference in the visibility. So as we walk down, sort of look at that, and then we're stopped two blocks down at the second raised intersection. There's some things that down there I want to show you down there. The last street you just crossed is called Florida Avenue. It's actually a private street. So because it's a private street, we could treat it like a driveway. So again, the sidewalk continues across it. It's concrete, it's not asphalt. We can't do that for a road because of the traffic, but it works great for that. The other thing I want to point out, Northampton Coffee, is just a symbolic story that we heard, which is, you know, people always come here. It's not like Pleasant Street's dead, but it's always been a lot less traffic than other places. The day Northampton Coffee opened, the amount of pedestrian traffic, footfall, went up quite significantly. And, and it sort of sent a message to us that there's, there's a lot of need. People want to come here. We just want to sort of open that up. And so part of this project included the sidewalks that go down Holyoke Street so that people who live in the neighborhood back there sort of have more options. Because one of the things we're hoping to do, you know, we, we have a shortage of parking on Thursday and Friday and Saturday nights. And maybe someday we'll build another parking garage. And I think personally think that would be great. But I want to make sure that people who walk, who live maybe half a mile from downtown, don't pop in their car. And, ha and, and four tenths of a mile is sort of this magic switching point. If the walk's nice, you go four tenths of a mile. If it's lousy, you don't go that far. And so we want to make the walk nicer from that neighborhood so more people come by, they stop for coffee in the morning, they do their sewing here, and they don't drive downtown, and they free up the parking spots down there. So that economic development piece goes both ways. Right, so this project helps make stores more vibrant and the vibrancy brings more people out and people attract people. Um, you also see a bunch of new trees along here that came as process. Again, the new uh, 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 bike racks here. There's a bunch of stuff that's more subtle but are still important, particularly for some populations. So, is David here? What's the, the magic side slope for a sidewalk? Two percent. So you, a sidewalk going across, you know, sidewalks allowed to be a maximum of five percent the way you're walking, but cross cutting is allowed to be a maximum of two percent. Um, a lot of the sidewalks in the street were steeper than that, and you know if you break it, you own it. So there's a lot of places where we had to do work flattening the sidewalks down. It's not real. Again, it's not really sexy, but I always pick on my 92-year-old mother. My 92-year-old mother would fall over at a three percent slide slope. Um, and so it's really important to sort of think about those things. So a lot of those details are in here as well. You see some really beat up sidewalk over there. We didn't touch that only because the next project that begins construction in October is the lumber yard and they'd be destroying it. So their, their commitment as part of the project is they fill that gap in when they're done at the end of the process. So it's not that we didn't notice that. We had some great news during the process. We think we get some credit for this. This is the economic development. That property changed hands in the middle of the project, and we think it was sort of about a vote of confidence in the future of Pleasant Street. Um, and the old owner was really fighting us about closing curb cuts. The new owner said, oh, please close the curb cuts. We'd love that. So one of the change orders we had in the process, we got to close an extra, Carol, an extra one or two curb cuts we were able to close. Two, okay. So we were able to close two curb cuts there because it was a new owner there, and the new owner's playing with all sorts of ideas for how that investment happens. So, I mean, for us, investment is we want all ends of the market. So we want the affordable housing. It's incredibly important for downtown, for workers, for, for social equity. But we also want the really high-end housing where people are going to spend $100 on dinner. And so we like sort of this combination is, you know, this building, yeah, this building's being redone. Again, changed hands recently. I'm not exactly sure what's going to happen there. So all that stuff sort of comes out of this. Um, again, the raised crosswalk over here. And again, that's the area we narrowed the road down to, to two 10 and a half foot lanes. Um, and then right over, it used to be until a year ago, something like that, the city road layout ended right here at Holyoke Street. And then it was a MassDOT layout. Um, and MassDOT gave us that land between Holyoke Street and Hockman Road. And the reason is MassDOT did a great job of running as a highway, right, where cars can come in. And that's exactly what we wanted. When downtown wasn't doing well, it was really important to bring all those cars in. But now that downtown's doing well, we want to narrow it. We still don't want to lose those cars. We want those 17,000 cars, but we want them to drive slower. And so we took over the street so we could narrow the road about, I don't know, 15 feet. Um, 
We could add these cycle tracks. We could add on-street parking. On-street parking is really the lifeblood of the businesses. Somebody asked me at, at, where we were walking the break about, isn't narrowing going to create a problem in terms of snow storage? Well, you know, we get to play with this. DPW can decide whether they're going to move snow or whether we're going to lose parking during the winter to snow storage there. Now, that will be, be their call, and they're partially based on what, what the needs are in the process. Um, but so we have the option. So we also play, again, there's an experiment. These cycle tracks. So th cycle tracks think of as being a bike lane on steroid, a bike lane that's physically separated so that if you're a wimpy bicyclist, you don't have to worry about cars. So we physically raise the bike lane and suddenly call it a cycle track or a buffered bike lane. Um, and on the right side, you see the sidewalk on the right. And then on the left, you see the ramp that goes up for bicyclists. And they go down together. You know, there's only a seam. so you. It's not that you're going to be mixing. If you're walking hand in hand with your sweetie, you can hold hands and one person can sneak onto the, the bicycle lane. Um, but it sends a message. We, bicyclists should feel comfortable being there. If you're a really strong bicyclist who keeps up with cars, there's no requirement to use a bike lane. You have every right to stay in the street. If you're wimpy like me and want to leave the street, you can use the bike lane, so we have choice. So on the southbound side, we experiment with concrete. We thought concrete was really important because the sidewalk was relatively narrow, and so we wanted the, the cycle track to make the sidewalk feel wider. Uh, on the, the east side of the road, the inbound side, where there's a separation, it's basically a cycle track, and then a tree belt, and then a sidewalk. There we use different materials to send the message. So the, the sidewalk is concrete, and the cycle track is asphalt. That's more typical. Using different materials sends a clear message, and it worked there because of, because of the trees. Um, so we're going to walk down there. The last thing I want to show you is sort of we're trying to do some interesting work in terms of drainage. Um, so we're going to show you sort of a rain garden and areas we've tried to recapture down there. Valley CDC, together with Wayfinders, is developing the old uh, Northampton Lumber site. It's going to be a four-story building. Um, it will have 55 family affordable rental units. What it do you mean by affordable rental? What does the rental mean? There's going to be a range. What is the range? So um, some of the units will have project-based Section 8s, which means that you as a tenant pay 30% of your income. Um, the 60% units are going to be about 25% to 30% below market rate. So a one bedroom, so a one bedroom is around 850, for example, with all the utilities included. But feel free to call us if you want all the all the numbers. Um, so we are due to go under construction this fall with this building. Again, it's 55 units. It will have commercial space on this end of the building. It's an L-shaped building that wraps around. And it will have some commercial space on Holyoke Street as well that will be Valley CDC's offices. We're going to relocate to there. And then we will be opening this up to any other kind of market commercial rental on this end of the building. There are 41 units of parking, parking spaces. Oh, all, all the way to the corner? So it was just purchased by an investor and they're looking at their options. So we know it's going to get redone and the, the owner doesn't know yet. They're still looking well, hopefully it ties in with this over here. I also wanted to mention that I mentioned the MassWorks grant, the economic development grant that we got, 2.5 million. A big chunk of that is actually to move a 1846. The first storm drain in the city. The first storm drain in the city. It was actually made out of brick that actually runs right through the lumberyard property um, and needs to be moved to go around the new building. Um, and again, the economic development infrastructure grant from the state is exactly for those kinds of projects to support housing and economic development. So I think that truck that just left with those giant uh, pieces of sheeting that they're driving down into the ground because they're basically going to be unearthing 
uh, that storm sewer, discontinuing it, and then moving it. And again, that's all being paid for uh, with a uh, with a MassWorks grant as part of this overall project. If the first thing you hit was this raised intersection, a raised crosswalk, it really wouldn't be safe. Cars would still be going fast. So adding on-street parking down there and narrowing the street is probably more important for this than the raised intersection. The federal highway or uh, federal transit, someone just released at the federal level, just released a new study saying the best thing you can do for bicyclists is to slow the speed of traffic, right? So all the other bicycle stuff we do is great, but it's slowing the speed is really what makes it work for Jim's people. The other thing in terms of that land use, so Laura talked mostly about the housing and a little bit about the commercial part. So in Northampton, on commercial areas, and this is commercial, we don't allow housing on the first floor in a commercial district facing the street. And so this is, again, part of the system. Housing's great. I live in a residential neighborhood. I like it. But we know you get a lot more foot traffic when there's sort of commercial stuff going on. So Laura go, you know, adding her nice glass storefront, adding spaces there and Live 155, adding commercial space there is both made possible by the project that we're doing, because there'd be more foot traffic to support businesses, but it also is going to generate more foot traffic, which means the cars will know it, right? So you all know if you drive through downtown, you're likely to see a pedestrian, and you're probably a little more careful than you may be if you drive through, I don't want to pick anybody, but some other town where nobody's ever walking. Um, and Route 9 and Hadley. So, you know, so it all fits back and forth, and so that, that whole story fits together. We're trying, you know, one of the things that I took as a personal failure is when there's a fire in the building that's right here, the place of the big lawn, and they rebuilt as multifamily housing. And that was sort of a vote of no confidence in Northampton. They were saying, I have prime real estate with 17,000 cars a day, and the highest and best use I can do is residential right up to the floor. That means they didn't think they could, find, they could attract any retail, which pays higher rent, or any offices that pay higher rent. And so we hope that would never happen again, that the next time a building gets redeveloped, we want lots of housing. We love all the housing that Valley's doing, but we'd like it hidden in back. We'd like it above the first floor. We'd like the first, I mean, our standard's only 30 feet back from the sidewalk, but at least we want a 30-foot buffer along every sidewalk to be commercial, and then the rest can be whatever we want. Yeah. yeah. Um, is the new building here going to be solar ready or even have solar panels on it? Yes. The new building, the question is, will it be solar ready and will it have solar panels? And it's yes to the first part, and I hope so to the second part. We need to wait and see how our budget plays out. So, so you've all read about Houston flooding, yeah. and you've probably read about how many people in Houston don't have federal floodplain insurance. And the reason is if you live in the floodplain, you can't get a mortgage without floodplain insurance. But if you don't live in a floodplain, you don't get floodplain insurance because you don't have to. Even though it's actually expensive in a floodplain and cheap not in a floodplain. Except that Northampton is protected by dikes. And the flood elevation is about here if we had a really big storm and the dikes failed. Now, we don't think they're going to fail. DPW does a great job maintaining them. With the city's new stormwater utility, they're doing a much better job than they were before and sort of caught up for deferred maintenance. But nonetheless, this is the floodplain if you didn't have a dike system there. Um, and so things like this are really useful because they hold some floodwaters. You can imagine, even if the dikes hold, during a big storm, we have some massive pumps at the sewage treatment plant that are pumping the water out from downtown because the Connecticut River is now higher than downtown. And so the more we can store water during those storms, you know, again, this is mostly demonstration. That alone is going to have an infinitesimal effect. Um, but everything counts. DPW did this a big demonstration project at Pulaski Park. All the big water features you see in the middle of Pulaski Park, they're designed to look gorgeous, but they're actually also a stormwater treatment as well, as well. So it's all part of the message in doing this. The only way we ever catch up for, you know, 100 years of not doing this is each project we do has little things. They're often undramatic. So by the Daily Hampshire Gazette, if you go along, it looks like DPW messed up when they redid Con Street and just left out one of the curbs. That was totally deliberate. That's so that water in Con Street floods off and goes there. And so some of these things are really, you know, not exciting, but every single project or almost every project these days is including some of those, those elements.